you know, the, the concept of the filter bubble, uh, you know, the filter bubble is this uh, kind of personal universe of information that is built for us by uh, mostly algorithmically and by our, by our friends, right? And, um, you know, so part of it is populated by your Facebook news feed um, and your Twitter stream, but increasingly also uh, websites are building personalization functionality into every website that you go to. So uh, we don't all see uh, the same exact uh, page when we load the New York Times. We see this recommended for you section that pulls up uh, based on the data that these companies have about us, uh, what articles they think we might be interested in. And um, often that's really helpful. You know, uh, in, in Netflix, I like my Netflix recommendations. Uh, you know, I, I often actually do find that those New York Times articles are helpful. But it's important to recognize that it's really a very different information universe from the kind of broadcast universe that we're used to because the process by which our media world is populated is a passive process mostly. This isn't, you know, we're not choosing uh, to turn on Fox News or to pick up a copy of The Nation. Um, all of this code is looking at all of our kind of aggregated data and trying to decide what we might be interested in and display that to us. And I think that has some important consequences because of the way that that personalization is done. So I'm not as sanguine that in a social world, people are naturally going to come across the kind of important public interest information that they will come across um, in, in the old media world. And let me just add one quick example here, which is, um, you know, if you talk to folks at The Guardian or The New York Times about um, Afghanistan stories, right, um, they routinely bomb in terms of clicks. If clicks is your metric, um, these are stories that just don't do well. Um, and of course, they end up on the front page anyway because there's an editorial decision that, you know what, we're in a democracy, we're all making decisions here together about whether we go to war or not. People have to pay attention to Afghanistan, even if it's unpleasant and kind of complicated and not the kind of content that people naturally want to share on Facebook. People have to do that. I think as we move into a world where you're not going to the New York Times first in the morning, you're going to Facebook, and Facebook is then uh, exposing you to content, there's a real question about what happens to that whole category of stories, right? Because it's sort of been artificially uh, bumped up above sort of demand uh, because people have these other values that they're incorporating into media. Journalistic responsibility, I think, would probably be the, the idea yeah, some behind, sense of yes, of eth ethics, the greater yeah. good. I would just say that I was an example of sort of the the fallout effect of the filter bubble. I was at the RNC last week, which in and of itself was a bit of a filter bubble, um, and it was really striking. Erin Carmen at Salon did a piece about talking to Republican women about their views on the birth control debate and found that they had all of their facts so messed up from whatever news sources they were getting it from, be it Fox News or Rush Limbaugh. And so that in and of itself, I think, is a filter bubble. But a, one of the reasons Fox has had so much success is that it's appealing to people's emotional side, the partisan side that's, I think, rooted in emotion. And one thing Jonah was talking about, which I thought was interesting, is everything he was talking about was focused on people's emotional reaction to what they're seeing. You see the two basset hounds, you want to pet them, it feels like you're with your family. So how then do news organizations wh whose mandate is not emotional, it's to report the news, make their stories appealing to a wider audience? How do they navigate out of that so that, that you're getting, you're pulling in people from different places that, to content that isn't just appealing to someone's emotion or instinct to share. Yeah, and, and I think that's one of the great and really actually fun and interesting questions that um, the media creators face right now, which is um, how, do you, how do you sell your content in a, in a, you know, your content about stuff that matters in a, you know, Facebook-centric world? Um, and, you know, I think Jonah was totally right about that. You have to build it for the way that people are engaging with the platform. So. Um, this is a lot of what we think about at Upworthy, um, and Upworthy is basically a site that's, you know, the, the, the premise is we're going to try to amplify little bits of content that have some social value 
um, but that might not always, uh, you know, compete in the Darwinian world of the news feed against all of the puppies. Um, we're going to try to kind of <laughs> give them all of the lift that we can. Um, you know, I think, number one, uh, you go back to the kind of art of great headline writing, but in a new way. Um, you know, so at Upworthy, we, we write 25 headlines for each piece of content. And the goal is to come up with something that stirs people's interest enough that they click through. And again, all of the content that we're trying to sell is content that isn't naturally necessarily the most sellable content. It's, it's you know, um, look at this infographic on media consolidation. That's not something that um, is cl as clickable as uh, the two Basset Hounds. Um, but, you know, uh, but so we, we, we try to write headlines that create a kind of curiosity gap where people, where it, you know, says to people, hey, there's something interesting that you don't know just behind this link. Uh, and then we try to, um, you know, make sure that the payoff of what's behind the link is greater than the uh, cu curiosity that it creates so that people go, oh, wow, I'm really glad that I kind of, I turned around that blind corner. Now I want to share this with all of my friends. Um, and so I think, you know, the packaging, as Jonah said, you know, just is, is super important, more important than ever. Um, and it really surprises me how few media organizations, you know, think about, you know, this is no longer a one size fits all content world. Mm -hmm. We really need to be making content that fits the places that consumers are in, in better wit. And I was, I was thinking earlier as I was watching Jonah and also, I get so much of my news off my Facebook now and also Twitter that I feel that certain news organizations have to uh, have different voices for different platforms. That it's not enough for the New York Times to get a great scoop and have a, a fantastic story on Iraq and put it on their homepage. They then need to cater the, that headline to what people on Facebook might be attracted to, what people on Twitter might be attracted to, what people on Tumblr might be attracted to, which are three very different things. And uh, you were just talking about how you have an extra staff devoted to a Twitter feed right now during the conventions to push out content in a, in a different voice. Right. So do we need to, is it more that catering different faces to different places than changing content? Yeah, it's partly, I mean, it is, I mean, number one, it, you know, and we don't need to belabor this because you all know this, but, um, you know, it is increasingly an environment in which people expect to hear from real live human beings and not from institutional and voices, right? Facebook, all of the real things that are happening in Facebook come from people. And all of the fake things like the ads and the annoying stuff comes from institutions and from apps that you've installed. And so if you want to speak in a way that people are expecting to, you know, people are trying to filter very quickly for like, what's the stuff I need to pay attention to and what's the stuff that I don't? And you need to be able to talk in the way that people, that cues people to pay attention. Um, you know, but yeah, I think Facebook creates a very different kind of content experience for better and worse than Twitter does, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, uh, you know, Facebook is a gamified conversation experience, right? You're, you're, uh, you get points for saying clever things uh, in the form of likes, and those are little hits that you, you get. And so there are different kinds of incentives in terms of what you might say on Facebook than what you might say on Twitter, where it's not as gamified in that particular way. There are retweets, so a little bit. But, you know, anyway, it just, and, and it's bewildering because there's like a million of these things and you have to learn, you know, just when you're done figuring out Twitter, there's Instagram and just when you're done with Instagram, there's, you know, formspring.me, which is a 40 million person social network mostly used by high school students to bully each other. Um, true story, actually. Uh, but, you know, there's, it, it's very, very difficult, and it's no longer the case that you can just post something on your website and expect it to be shared widely. My takeaway is always that what gets shared, the core of viral is authenticity, which we talked about a little bit. And the two examples, recent examples, just in the last few days, one comes from Upworthy, which is a 
a clip they posted of Mitt Romney meeting with a veteran who happens to be sitting at a table with, who's gay and happens to be there with his husband. And Mitt Romney, there's sort of this realization that comes across Mitt Romney's face. You might have seen this on your Facebook page too, because it's literally been popping up with great frequency on mine. And the other one, so that's a great example. And the other one I think last week was Clint Eastwood's moment at the RNC, which was so perfect for the internet world and for a sort of a viral content in really destructive ways for the Republican Party. And I think it can be funny. It might be less funny if you're a Democrat and the same thing happened with Joe Biden or something. Who knows? But it's just, there are two both really classic examples of things going viral and both of them are very authentic. So I think one of the challenges all news organizations come up against is how to make something go viral. Can you manufacture authenticity or do you need to? And because right. I think when we were talking, the Mitt Romney clip that you guys posted was actually not new. It, it was from almost a year ago or less, a little less than a year ago. So this is one of the most fascinating things that we've learned in the last uh, five months of, of doing uh, Upworthy is we really thought you had to get there first in order to uh, harness that magical viral fairy dust. And um, it turns out that that's just totally not true. Uh, it doesn't matter when the thing that you're pushing out was originally created. It just matters how well suited it is for the moment that you're in and how well packaged it is, right? And, and part of the reason for that is that people say, oh, that video already got a million views. A million views, that's a lot of views. Um, people have probably seen this, right? Well, how many people are on the internet in the United States? You know, just randomly, there's like a one in 200, one in 250 chance that uh, someone has seen something with a million views. Uh, and so what matters much more than kind of has it made the rounds before or uh, is it new is does it speak to where people are in the moment? And so this, the Romney clip that, um, that Glennis is, is referring to, uh, you know, we posted that on um, Monday of this week, I guess, and it's already gotten over a million more views in the last couple of days, purely through social sharing, purely because this is a moment where it speaks to people in a way that it didn't six, six months ago. And it blew up your followers on Facebook. Right. My yes. No, we, we had a fun uh, week of it. Um, we, we were at about 100,000 followers on Facebook in, at the beginning of the month, and we're now at about 147,000 or so. So it like literally it's only the added 50%. Um, that's the power of, you know, when you do get this stuff right, and it's really kind of, we, we didn't know when we started out on this if you could kind of restrict yourself to the set of content that's a bit more wonky and hard to work with and you know not as as easily digestible as some of the viral fare out there you know would that work are people interested in that stuff and i think it's really good news and you know and the stuff that we do you know just um you know, is only a very small subset of that kind of content. I think it's good news for all of the people who are creating those kinds of content that it's really, you know, it's not necessarily the case that the internet doesn't want that stuff anymore. It just wants it in a slightly different package than the one that a lot of us are providing it in. And if we can figure that piece out, then I think there is some hope that, uh, you know, that the stories about Afghanistan or the stories about, uh, you know, teen obesity or whatever it is, um, you know, can still reach a large audience, even though people are living in their Facebook feeds or, or in these more fragmented worlds. And I think it's worth pointing out for those of you who are not totally familiar with Upworthy that you basically launched on Facebook. Upworthy does technically have a site, but primarily you did your launch and pushed out, so you basically exist on Facebook. Is that right. True? Yeah, no, we, we, we decided, we, I actually really wish that we had done this. We almost like didn't have a home page where if you tried to go to our home page, it would just redirect to some random other page on the site. Um, because the, the theory was uh, people aren't, you know, there, there are less and less sites that people type in in the, in the morning and go check in, oh, I want to see what's going on at x.com. Um, and more people go to Twitter and Facebook. Um, and that's how they are exposed to this content. And so we really think of Facebook um, as our front page. You know, our, our, our Facebook followers are our front page more than 
um, you know, our actual website is. If you go, there is a web, there is a home page. Unfortunately, we sort of, you know, it's just a bad home page. But um, <laughs> but but that was kind of theory behind it. And do you think that the sort of two questions really? What what does the news look like in five years? I mean, I know that's an impossible question to answer because literally in a year we probably will have be having a completely different discussion. But what does it mean to a news organization? And I always sort of default to the New York Times as an example. If, if social is how they're getting everything out, how does that change their mandate? Does it change their mandate? Does everything have to be niche now? Can we have a general, a, a general news organization that doesn't need to incorporate happy basset hounds underneath the table? Or is that just the new reality? Are we going to have to, is, is uh, the New York Times, who did partner with BuzzFeed for the elections, by the way, uh, going to have to have happy lolcats or something like that to, to share those stories? Um, well, I mean, I, I can kind of go either way on this. I, I, so let me do the dystopian version first, um, which is, you know, I think there's a real possibility that a lot of, that, that whole big chunks of the area that we think of as kind of public interest media or media about substantive stuff, that, that big chunks of that fall out of sight for most of the public because it isn't actually as optimized for uh, the Facebook news feed as the lolcats. And um, so what that means is that people just, it's not, it's not even the partisan echo chamber problem. It's this bigger thing of uh, people just not being exposed to newsy content very much at all. Um, you know, there's a, 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 a great uh, a researcher named Marcus Pryor um, at, at Princeton who looked at the shift in information in, in um, knowledge about public events as you move from kind of a broadcast world to a cable news world to an internet world. And it's really interesting, you know, basically in a broadcast news world, like if you go back to 1970, you have this kind of bell curve distribution of knowledge about political information. Most people are kind of in the middle, they know a bit about what's going on. You have, you know, a few people at the, at the top and a few people at the bottom. And the reason for that, he, he hypothesized, was that um, you know, if you're at home at 6 p.m., you can't watch anything but the news. There are three channels, and they're all showing the news. And so you have to pay attention to the news whether you want to or not. And conversely, if you want to be a news junkie, it's, it's kind of challenging to, you know, there's only so much information that's available to you. As, as we move into this new uh, world where people's choices and these algorithms are, um, are, are, are making those calls, you shift from that bell curve to a power curve where you have people who know every freaking detail about everything that's going on, um, you know, and, and, and they know far more than anyone did uh, in the 1970 world, but actually the, the median shifts downward. So people on average know less, even though there's more information available to them now than they did in 1970, right? I mean, that's sort of, it, the, the easy thought experiment here, if you wanna, if you wanna kind of check this, is um, you know, foreign news used to be almost very difficult to get. If you wanted to get a subscription to Le Monde, uh, Le Monde uh, in, in 1970, really hard to do. Now foreign news is, is as easily available as any other kind of news. Yet are people more informed about what's going on in the rest of the world than they were in, even in 1990? Um, according to the Pew research studies on this, they're not. So just because information is available doesn't mean that it's getting out to a large audience. And I think that's the root of the dystopian view. The root of the more optimistic view is, well, we can actually change that. And if we package stuff up right, and if we pay close attention to what these algorithms are doing, and if we also kind of badger the algorithm writers to think differently about their responsibilities, you know, maybe they should be taking a little more uh, editorial responsibility for helping make sure that those other kinds of content propagate, um, you know, then you can see a world which is actually, um, you know, not uh, limited by all of the problems of the gatekeepers of today, but actually helping people get the information they need to make good decisions. And I think that's still very possible um, 
but I don't know which way it's going to go. Right. The algorithm makers are the, vo the new voice of God, I guess, is the, That's exactly the, hopeful, right. the hopeful view. OK, we have a, a few minutes for questions before everyone gets a strong drink. And the better the questions, the fewer of them we'll take, and the quicker we'll get to the drink. So. I think this is a fascinating discussion. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I come from, obviously, a different generation. I don't have to guess too quickly. And my world that I was brought up in was all trained to read the right-hand column of the New York Times. And that was the most important issue of the day. That's how we were brought up. And to this day, I still look to the right-hand column and uh, on print, uh, even though I'm in the digital media world. Uh, and for example, last week, I think, or maybe it was this week, there was a right-hand column article about uh, uh, management fees, uh, which were treated from the private equity funds. Mm -hmm. Right-hand column, strange, because it was a business issue, not involving a lot of people. but. The New York Times kind of told you this was important. And we were brought up that way. And of course, you have above the fold and below the fold. Uh, so it's an interesting how this world has changed. And that's what you're talking about, because that there is no one who's helping you set that benchmark anymore. Just so I'm friends. just curious uh, to make it into a question, because uh, I don't follow it actively enough. The New York Times right-hand column which is telling me that's the most important issue of the day, for those of you who don't know. Uh, on their online version, do they change that uh, frequently? Uh, you know, how do they treat the articles? Because that tells you what you're talking about, the fact and the filtering and what they need to sell online as opposed to what they've determined as journalists are, is the most important thing. Yeah, so the online version is different. You know, it's it's. I believe, and I'm not a New York Times front page editor, but you know the sort of main package at the top of the website is the one that they're highlighting. And they'll cycle through those on an hourly basis if they need to. But I think sort of the, the additional layer that you have to add on to it is that less and less, you know, that, that a huge amount of New York Times traffic um, is coming not from people going to the front page saying, what are the most important stories, and then clicking through to them, but from people looking at what their friends are talking about uh, and then getting to the New York Times that way. Um, and that's just a very different, you lose control of that ability, absolutely, to say, hey, this piece of news is really important, even though it sounds as boring as uh, I've already forgotten, uh, equity, private equity management fees. <laughs> Uh, you know, that doesn't do well on social. I, th uh, I think the front page of the New York Times homepage is still controlled by a person, which is not true of every major media homepage, and that they, they do, put, right. there, there is still a bit of what you're talking about, right-hand column. It might not stay blazed across the top, but there is still a sense that they have an idea of what they feel is important. But I would just say, I read the Valerie, Valerie Jarrett profile the other day that came across Twitter and Facebook for me and happened to randomly see a print copy of the paper later that afternoon and was stunned to see that that story was like the cover of the style section of the politics that came up. But I was like, oh, this is a big deal story to the New York Times. I had just read it as an offhand thing. So there's a, there's, it's, it's very different. And the, the editorial decision that went into determining what was important has been outsourced to your friends, essentially. And to you, and who, yeah. and who you follow, and if you get more of it on Twitter, I get a lot of my news on Twitter. Then it's been outsourced to my decision of who I follow on Twitter, which is a personal one. In the here, I'm not sure who's. <laughs> Hi, um, my question is: Is there a future for unbiased journalism, or is it just fading from existence? CNN would like to know the answer to that question. Yeah, right I don't now. know. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's challenging. I mean, definitely, I think it is hard to not declare your point of view in this world because actually, it, and this is, I don't know, it, this is sort of more controversial sounding than I, than I mean it, but you know, there's something inauthentic as a personal voice to having that objective stance. No one's actually like that, you know, not having opinions. And so in a, in a set of media that so reward authentic voiciness, it's really, 
challenging to have an authentic voice that is objective or that is, you know, sort of that has that same, that has that restraint. I think that's, to me, that's the biggest question is how you reconcile those things. I think there's definitely still room for people who hold themselves to high standards in terms of uh, truthfulness. And I think in, arguably there's more room than ever because people really want someone to go through all of the junk online and help them understand what they need to be paying attention to. That's why this curation, you know, buzzword is, is so hot right now. Um, so, you know, but those people often will have points of view even though they're performing that service for their audience. Okay. And I'm thinking of Ezra Klein, for example, at the Washington Post, who's very factually oriented, but also clearly has an ideological point of view on stuff. I would also just briefly point out that that sort of allegiance to object objectivity, uh, I associate a lot with when there was just three networks on television. And so because there, it was such a limited platform for information, it was very necessary. But if you go back to the newspaper environment in New York City at the beginning of the 20th century, you're not talking about, there was not a great deal of object, object, objectivity flying around. And so I, I am always hesitant to put a little too much weight on, are you being fair, are you being objective, are you being truthful, I think. And I think we see media organizations right now, and CNN is on my mind because I cover that industry, uh, falling down because they haven't figured out how to navigate how to be this idea of objectivity which doesn't really exist versus being honest and truthful. Exactly. And, and one final question, yes. so let's right. make this one awesome. <laughs> I'll try. E Eli, I loved your book. I thought it was one of the best reads I've read in, in a, a few years. Um, everyone should read it, Thanks. especially to that last question. My question is about from the more of the consumer side if I would like to be a digital consumer of content and not be a Luddite and read a paper, heaven forbid, anymore. However, I want to recreate some feeling of true serendipity in my information consumption. Is that possible? Yeah, I think actually uh, Twitter is a great medium for this in a lot of ways. You know, I, I follow Carl Rove on, on Facebook, and um, he doesn't show up a whole lot on Edge Rank for me because um, I'm more progressive in my views, and I don't know, I don't interact with Carl Rove a lot. Uh, <laughs> on Twitter, you know, he shows up because Twitter actually isn't doing any sort of uh, algorithmic uh, second guessing of my preferences. And if I put that then into Flipboard or something like that, you know, I can start to get a a fairly palatable, interesting mix of views. I think Twitter is great for that. Um, and again, I think there are lots of, I mean, this is sort of, I don't see these as insurmountable problems. I see these as really interesting engineering problems that someone smart is going to come along uh, and figure out great ways to solve. And I just hope that those people are, are driven you know, both by the desire to make something cool, but also to the, by the desire to make something meaningful and important um, that helps people make better decisions as a society. All journalism classes going forward should be uh, include, or programs should include a coding class because yeah. I think that is going to be a core of where all of this is going. So let's drink. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.